Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Joseph Berger. I am the Theater Operations and Events Manager at Film Forum, an independent, not-for-profit, four-screen cinema in Manhattan's West Village. This year, 2020, marks Film Forum's 50th anniversary. We are both proud of this milestone and working hard to ensure many more years as one of the nation's premier art house cinemas, especially through this challenging time. I'm speaking to you all live from my office on West Houston Street. This is yet another virtual event we are hosting while the theater is temporarily closed. So first and foremost, we wish you all health and happiness at this time. We are very excited for today's discussion about Frederick Wiseman's new film, City Hall. Film Forum has premiered more movies by Fred Wiseman than any other director in its 50 year history. City Hall encapsulates what Wiseman does best. It's a patient, incisive exploration of an institution, in this case, Boston's city government, that reflects how the mechanics of our democracy affect individuals and how issues like racial justice and affordable housing can be addressed. Please note that concurrent with our exclusive engagement of City Hall, we are also presenting Wednesdays with Wiseman, a three film program pairing rarely screened Wiseman films followed by Q and A's with special guests. This week we're offering his 1978 documentary, Sinai Field Mission, followed by a Q and A between Fred and Errol Morris. Today, however, we're very happy to welcome our guest moderator, Josh Siegel. Josh is a curator of film at the Museum of Modern Art and has organized more than 100 film, media, and gallery exhibitions, many of which have appeared on best of the year lists in the New York Times, Art Forum, Film Comment, and The New Yorker. He serves on the selection committee of the annual festivals, New Directors, New Films, and uh, Doc Fortnight. And he is the founding director of To Save and Project, the MoMA International Festival of Film Preservation. Josh is the co-editor and author of Frederick Wiseman, published in 2010, as well as Modern Contemporary Art at MoMA since 1980, and the monograph Baby, It's Cold Outside, A History of Finnish Cinema. Hi, Josh, how are you? Good to see you. Thanks for being here. Uh, and I'm thrilled to welcome uh, to the Zoom platform our special guest, Frederick Wiseman. Come on in, Fred. Fred really needs no introduction. Since his landmark debut, Titicut Follies from 1967, Fred has directed over 40 feature documentaries and is considered by many to be one of the greatest American filmmakers of all time. Fred is the winner of countless awards, including an honorary Oscar in 2016 and the Venice Film Festival Golden Lion for Lifetime Achievement in 2014. In 1970, Fred founded Zipporah Films, which continues to produce and distribute his prolific and unparalleled body of work. Hello, Fred, how are you? Good, thank you for that nice introduction. Thank you so much for being here. I'm gonna head out, Josh, and uh, have a great conversation. I'll see you guys very soon. Thanks so much, Joe. Um, before anything else, I just wanted to wish uh, Mike Majori of Film Forum a happy birthday and say that uh, I eagerly await the time when we can all return to Film Forum and see movies together. Uh, it's a place that's nourished me since my childhood and it's a place that supported Fred for virtually his entire filmmaking career. Um, so someday we will all be together again. But in the meantime, let me start by asking you, Fred, you know, how are you and where are you? Well, let me also wish my happy birthday. Uh, I'm in uh, Paris, France. Uh, in my uh, little graduate student apartment here, uh, and I'm trying to ride out uh, the resurgence of the COVID by, by not leaving my apartment. And can you say something about your longtime relationship to Paris as well as to Boston and Cambridge? Well, I, I, I first came to Paris uh, as a, my parents gave me a graduation present from college in the summer of 1951 and I spent some time here. And then I lived here with my wife from 56 to 58. Uh, and, you know, went to, the movie, went to the movies a couple of times a day into the theater almost every night. Uh, and I was here for almost two years uh, and, and loved it. And then I didn't come back for a long time. Uh, and then in, uh, in the mid uh, 1994, 
I got a call from a friend whom I had told that I wanted to make a movie about uh, the Comédie Française. And she said, well, I think you can get permission now. So I came over and, and I, in fact, did get permission. And then, uh, which, and I made the movie in 95. And then, uh, and, and then the Comédie asked me to direct a couple of plays there, which I did. And then I started to make a few movies in France. And, and then I started to edit the movies that I shot in America in Paris. And so for the last 12, 15 years, I've been in France at least nine months of the year. And why do you find it such a, 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 a um, embracing city for your editing? Um, why do you find well, you, you well, editing there for so many years now? Well, the editing, I mean, the editing is an excuse to live here. Uh, I mean, uh, and I like it here because it's a beautiful city. I discovered, you know, I'm probably the first to discover the food's good. Uh, <laughs> and uh, uh, I, I like to go to the theater a lot and there's very good theater in Paris. And I similarly uh, attend a lot of dance performances, particularly ballet performances. And there's a, a lot of good ballet in Paris. So, you know, I, I can work uh, for eight or 10 hours and go out and have a nice dinner or, or go to the theater or see a nice dance performance. Uh, or if I want to walk around the beautiful old city, I can do that. Uh, and, you know, I lived in Boston for a long time. I, um, you know, it's a nice uh, change of venue, as they say. And a previous interview, you mentioned that you had reached out to five or so cities to, to uh, in thinking about making a film about City Hall. And I'm wondering, not, not so that we can call for a boycott of those that turn you down, but just to get a sense of the kinds of cities you were looking for, can you tell us which ones you had, you had approached? Well, I think I wrote six letters. Uh, I wrote to Los An the mayor of Los Angeles, the mayor of Miami, uh, the mayor of South Bend, Indiana, uh, Mr. Buttigieg, uh, and uh, the mayor of Chicago, and the mayor of Boston. And I think I had two no's, three no answers. And I got a, a, a letter from the mayor, uh, the woman, Joyce Linehan, who's the head of the mayor's policy planning group, uh, uh, asked me to come in for a meeting. And, it, and then I discovered when I went to the meeting that my original letter to the mayor had been opened by his secretary who, as luck would have it, had seen in like some of my movies. Hmm. So she passed it on to Joyce. And Joyce, again, as luck would have it, liked my movies. And so she recommended it to the mayor. And I went in and had a meeting. And I said, OK. So it's pure good luck. And it ended up in your backyard. I mean, it ends up in yeah. the, I mean, I, the garage. I, uh, I probably, had I been given the choice of all six city halls, I still would have done Boston but I didn't have a choice of six. Well, I have to scold uh, Eric Garcetti because he and I went to college together, so. Uh, ah, well, you should, uh, you know. You know, He's, he, uh, he, he knows better. Um, I think we need to acknowledge the, uh, the elephant and the donkey in the room uh, by saying that we are two days away from an existential election. Uh, just this morning, Dr. Fauci said we are ill-prepared for the plague as we enter winter flu season. Um, uh, Black Lives Matter has become uh, um, one of the more, if not the most urgent concerns of our time. Uh, and I'm wondering whether you see this film differently now, given all that's happened in 2020 than when you made it. Well, I mean, I don't know that I see it differently, but I think the response to the film is different than it would have been, say, if I had made and released the film when Obama was president. Uh, if the film had been released when Obama was president, I think a reaction, I mean, I, it's hard to predict, but I think a likely reaction would have been, you know, Mayor Walsh is a good mayor and it's nice to see him and his staff working very hard in Boston uh, to provide uh, 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 important and useful services. But uh, in the context of four years of Trump, 
and his idiocies, his incompetencies, his insanity, uh, uh, a good mayor, the activities of a good mayor uh, like uh, Marty Walsh are, are underlined and, and, and their importance is, uh, uh, and, you, and, you, and the importance of good government is, is, uh, is emphasized. Uh, so, I mean, that's uh, my response to your, your question. Well, one thing I think that's interesting or that comes to the fore in watching this film now from this perspective is we've seen over the last year that the onus has fallen to mayors to, uh, to uh, cope with COVID and, and other um, crises in ways that the federal government has failed to do so. And it's interesting to me that you see in some ways in this film a mayor who and his team who have laid the groundwork for preparedness. Um, and so I wonder whether, for example, you got the scent, you approached the city with a mind to showing uh, a functioning city government in ways that perhaps you didn't with a film like Welfare. I'm wondering, example, how your approach has changed or your sensibility with respect to institutions, but also to their um, their bureaucracies? Well, I don't think, well, I, I don't know, I could say that my attitude toward bureaucracies has changed, but I approach this subject the same way I've approached every other subject. Uh, it's, it's very rare in my experience that I know a lot about the subject before I start. In this case, I might have been in City Hall once when I was living in Boston, but uh, I live in a, a city right next to Boston, in Cambridge, and I rarely ever went to Boston when I was living in Cambridge. I didn't follow Massachusetts or Boston politics at all. So uh, uh, I can either describe my, uh, I can say I went into either an empty head or a clean slate, uh, uh, but I certainly knew nothing. And it's not unusual for me to start a film that way uh, because I like to think that the final film, it reflects what I learned as a consequence of being at the place. In this case, I was at the city hall for cumulatively for about 10 weeks. Um, and I spent about 10 months editing it. And editing it means studying the material and studying the sequences. So um, I, 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 I never start a film with an attitude or a point of view toward the subject. I mean, you mentioned welfare. I mean, I, you know, for, I mean, not ever having been a welfare recipient or a welfare worker or ever having visited a welfare center, except maybe for two hours, uh, a couple of weeks before I started the shooting the film, I didn't know anything. Uh, and what you see, uh, whatever comments you might have or whatever way the bureaucracy, the welfare center is presented in the film. And I don't think, uh, my attitude toward the people working in the welfare center could be summarized in 25 words or less, because if that was the case, I shouldn't have made the movie. Uh, uh, but what you see of the welfare bureaucracy in the movie is what I found uh, and what I learned. And that, uh, from my point of view, that's true of all the movies. Well, and then I wonder whether City Hall has in some sense learned from its mistakes over the last 50 odd years because much of the comments about welfare when it came out was its absurdist humor, its Kafka-esque um, uh, labyrinthine uh, bureaucracy that um, these literally poor people couldn't extricate themselves from. And now we find in a film like City Hall, it seems to me, um, 311, which didn't exist 50 years ago, good signage in City Hall itself to find out where you're going in this brutalist building. So do you think that in some ways there is some sense of improvement that's taken place? Uh, well, you know, I'm very bad at cultural generalizations. I know. Uh, 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 but what I'm not afraid to say is I think the film does illustrate what I found, which is that Mayor Walsh and his staff are people of goodwill trying to do a good job and offering 
uh, successfully offering uh, important services to the people of Boston. I, I'm not, I would no way say it's utopian. I would no way say it's ideal, but it, the fact that they're committed to make the effort and they're learning from their experience and that there is an ideological commitment, a serious ideological commitment to help people, I think it is the most you can ask for. And I think, at least I hope that uh, their efforts come across in the film. I mean, it, it's, it's different than welfare because in welfare, every sequence dealt with a petitioner, almost every sequence dealt with a petitioner asking for services. And sometimes the requests were reasonable. Sometimes they were irrational. Sometimes the welfare workers were exhausted because they've been listening to the same horrible stories for 20 or 30 years. But, but e even, I mean, I, I think those earlier characterizations that you quoted about welfare, I, I don't disagree with them, but I also think it's important to, to recognize that the welfare workers and welfare were trying and doing the best they could, given the limitations of their training, the, the, uh, the skimpiness of their salaries and the burden of dealing with these very complex and 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 uh, heart rendering and sad human issues. You know, five days, eight hours a day, five days a week, uh, and, and so I mean, from my point of view, despite the comedy in the movie, which you know is is there certainly. Uh, I think the movie presents the welfare workers as, as trying. I mean, they're, you know, it, it's easy to forget that the, the decisions that they are making to give money to people are based on rules and regulations and that the money that they're distributing comes from the taxpayer. So that they have an obligation, the welfare worker has an obligation to follow the rules. And the rules may not always be in the best interest of every petitioner, but the welfare worker has an obligation to interpret the rules uh, in the best interest of the client. And you see them doing that, sometimes successfully, sometimes not. But the, the basic human situations are absurd. It's not so much that, uh, I don't know, absurd. They're basic human situations which one can respond to as feeling they're absurd. One of the things that comes across though is that many of the people who work at City Hall are given a little bit more free reign to make decisions of their own. That's the impression I get when watching the film. For example, we're obviously not talking about welfare, we're talking about parking tickets, but you can waive parking tickets based on your gut instinct of whether the person is dissembling or not, or whether you just want to give the person a break. <laughs> You know, and so I feel like there's a lot, it's, it's a lot less top down. The impression you give, at least, is that it's a lot less top down uh, the way it's organized. Well, I, you know, I, I think it's certainly true that they're ideologically speaking or policy speaking from the point of view of policy, Mayor Walsh has, has tried to humanize, and I think in most cases successfully humanize the delivery of services. And I think that's not only to his credit, it's also to the credit of the people who are in daily contact uh, with the citizenry who are coming uh, uh, for help. Can you say something, for those who don't know, about how you choose which meetings to attend? I mean, you're given, how, how does the process work? You're given the schedule every day of what's taking place at City Hall, and then you have to pick and choose? Say well, something about that. It, it, you know, uh, uh, I was assigned a liaison. Uh, and so somebody uh, I could call up and say, uh, you know, what's going on today? Or I'd like, I'd like to spend today with the fire department, or I'd like to go to a police roll call. Uh, and she would make the arrangements. Uh, but, uh, or I would say, are there any meetings on affordable housing? And she'd say, well, there are three coming up uh, in the next 10 days. Uh, and I would, might go to all three, or I might just go to one, depending on what the competing possibilities uh, were. Uh, and of course, I would have no, I have no idea in advance 
Uh, other than the fact that it's a meeting about affordable housing, which is doesn't is too vague to say anything specific. I have no idea who the participants are going to be, or what the specific issues uh, that are on the agenda, what the issues that are on the agenda for that day are. So when you go to a meeting like that, uh, say on affordable housing, you have to shoot the whole meeting because there's only one inflexible rule in this kind of filmmaking. That is, if you try to guess or try to anticipate what's going to be said, uh, you're, you're in a, and you turn off the camera because you think it's boring, that's when the good material will be uh, spoken or, or uh, acted out. Uh, uh, so when I go to a meeting, I shoot the whole meeting uh, and then figure out later in the editing whether or not I want to use any part of it and how I'm going to use the part that I select. I want to read something you wrote in your, and I, and I don't want to give a plug to our book, but let me give a plug to our book. Um, you wrote a wonderful essay about your, 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 not only your own autobiography, but also the way you approach filmmaking. And I want to read just one thing that you wrote and ask you to maybe expand on it. Um, you're talking about editing, as you just mentioned. Uh, I have to understand the connection between the first and last minutes of the film and the significance of the order selected for the intervening sequences. The film has to work for me on a literal level and at its periphery as a metaphor or at least an abstract statement that is more than the sum of the literal meaning of each sequence. Can you say something more about that idea of abstraction? Because I, f I find it really quite fascinating. I mean, it's, 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 you, you're always very leery, understandably, about making any sorts of generalizations, but there is this aspiration toward abstraction. So I wonder if you could expand on that a little. Well, I, I, I can take a sequence from City Hall. There's a sequence in City Hall that takes place on Veterans Day, uh, November 11th. And it's uh, a meeting run by the Office of Veterans Affairs in which veterans uh, from the Second World War, uh, the Korean War, the Vietnam War, the Iraqi War, uh, the Afghanistan War are present, uh, telling their stories. And there are a lot of uh, other veterans. Uh, and the veterans I just, uh, uh, of those wars that I just mentioned all spoke, but the audience was mainly veterans of the, those and other wars. Uh, and, um, the sequence starts, it was in Faneuil Hall in Boston. And Faneuil Hall is an iconic place for the American Revolution. So the mere fact that it's in Faneuil Hall is important. Literally, it's a hall where a meeting is taking place. But the fact that it's Faneuil Hall already suggests the founding of the country, the writing of the Declaration of Independence, uh, the, the reasons that the American uh, democracy was founded, the reasons behind uh, the Constitution uh, and, the, and the, the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution. So the, the mere fact that Centennial Hall has resonance. Uh, and then uh, you see pictures, paintings that are hanging on the wall. The meeting is taking place in a, a museum of armaments. Hmm. Uh, uh, that's run by uh, a group of, of, of veterans. But you see paintings on the wall that recount various aspects of American history. You see there's a painting of the pilgrims arriving. There's a painting of uh, the pilgrims at war with the Indians. There's a painting of the uh, pilgrims making peace with the Indians. There's a painting of George, you know, it's a copy of the famous painting of George Washington crossing uh, the Delaware. So I use those paintings. The literal aspect is that in Faneuil Hall, there's a museum uh, and those paintings are hanging in the museum. The abstract aspect of is what is suggested by those aspects of American history and their a relation to what's going on now. So, uh, and then, uh, and then the, the veterans of all the various wars that I outlined a moment ago speak. Well, I mean, uh, as well as the mayor, the mayor speaks. And, but, but the, the, the veterans, most of the veterans are talking about 
their immediate experience in war. One tells a story of how, how he was wounded and almost died. Another tells how he uh, uh, bought an M1 and uh, had people who had participated in various wars autograph the M1. And he talks about his relationship to his neighbor, et cetera. But it, so the literal aspect is you're hearing veterans recount their own experience. The abstract aspect is you're getting some sense of the horror of war. Mm -hmm. uh, and, 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 you know, you could, you could uh, describe in a shorthand way, you could, dis you could characterize war as the absence of government, as the absence of the, re the, the absence of a, a means of resolving disputes by Pacific means. And, uh, and, 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 and what you see in city hall and what you see in, in any aspect of government in, in a democracy, um, people trying sometimes very successfully in the case of city hall, sometimes less successfully to resolve disputes and, and to establish minimum standards of behavior. So that if somebody wants to open a restaurant, uh, they can't just open up a restaurant uh, according to their standards of what constitutes uh, uh, safety precautions for food, they have to meet the minimum standards in the city's regulations. And those standards are, are um, uh, uh, people inspect the restaurant to determine whether the, uh, the owners, uh, the people who work there, the cooks and the owners or whatever, uh, are meeting the minimum standards for uh, uh, preparation of uh, healthy food. Well, you go all the way down the line. C city government touches more aspect of our lives than any other than any other form of government, whether uh, state or federal. Birth, marriage, death, fire, police, uh, uh, welfare, hosp public hospitals, on uh, building inspections, safety inspections, restaurant inspections, on and on and on. Well. There is a consensus ar arrived at that the city has the right, the citizenry gives to the city, cedes to the city, the right to impose those standards and regulations. In the absence of those standards and regulations, it would be chaos. Chaos was, you know, leads to uh, verbal disputes, to physical disputes, or can lead to war. So. The, the coming back to the scene in, in Faneuil Hall, the, the, uh, I, I tried to describe both the literal aspects of the scene, the activities of veterans in Iraq or Afghanistan or wherever, but the metaphoric aspect is it underlines the need for a civil society to resolve disputes of which city hall or the activities of city government are one example. Well, it's, it's interesting because, of course, one of the accusations Trump has been making in the last at least a year is that, you know, cities are chaotic, anarchical, that Antifa has taken them over, that uh, they're dangerous places. And, uh, you know, the thing that's interesting that you portray in this film is a sense not, I wouldn't go so far as to say racial harmony, but at least the recognition that uh, race matters really, literally, that, that, that um, you've, you've approached a city that has historical reputation for being racist, right? But right. You've, you've put the lie to that to some extent. And I wonder whether the city is, for you, as somebody who grew up there, changed in dramatic ways uh, or not. Whether you describe wars, well, the, the, the war that takes place in a city for example, is racial strife, right? Um, that's the breakdown. So one of the wars. One of the wars, but it's a breakdown of society, right? It's a breakdown right. of the functioning of a city. And, and how have you seen the city change in that way in terms of, for you as a Jew, as an immigrant, you know? Well, well I mean, it, it, again, it's hard to generalize because I, I come back to the point that before I made City Hall, I had no real awareness of the role of the city government in the daily life. The, whatever awareness I had was from reading the newspapers, which is very partial. 
Uh, I'm not saying it was fake news, but I mean, I, I, I didn't uh, have the intimate acquaintance uh, that I do as a result of being allowed to hang around City Hall for 10 weeks. Uh, so, but similarly, as someone who lived in Boston uh, for a long time, and I remember uh, I, I once was in Roxbury uh, during, in the midst of a riot and seeing the police march down the street with wearing gas masks and carrying uh, defensive shields. Uh, 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 and I, when was this? I'm sorry? When was this? It was 1967. Hmm. Uh, and I remember uh, all the turmoil around uh, school integration in Boston and busing. Uh, and, and, and I also remember growing up that Boston was a very ghettoized city. I mean, there was the South Boston was the Irish neighborhood. The North End was the Italian neighborhood. Uh, Dorchester and Roxbury, at the time I was growing up, were the Jewish neighbor was the Jewish neighborhood. The black population wasn't very big at that point. That that uh, black population grew more after the war, uh, and it's still ghettoized to some extent, but nowhere near to the extent that it was then. For example, when I grew up. Jews couldn't live in certain neighborhoods. I mean, it was impossible for my parents, or almost impossible for my parents to buy a house in, in a suburb of Boston called Brookline. Mm -hmm. uh, we lived in a, in a part of Boston called Brighton. And uh, uh, Harvard, the great Harvard, had a Jewish quota until 1950. Yale had it until 1960. Uh, so, and, and I remember as a child listening to Father Coughlin, who was an anti-Semitic priest, uh, rant every Sunday on the, on the radio. And I remember, re as, even as a child, my father giving me some of Henry Ford's editorials in the Dearborn newspaper to read. So, and, and, and Boston reflected uh, both uh, ge geographically, in, in, in terms of its neighborhoods, the ethnicity uh, of its neighborhoods, uh, the the prejudice, the severe prejudice that existed uh, for immigrants of all sorts at, at that time. That's obviously l much less true now, although it's still true. I mean, the, are there still racial tensions in Boston? Of course there are. Are they different? Yes. Has there been progress? Yes. But is there a lot, a lot more progress needed? Of course. Well, it's interesting. One of the lines about machine politics, of course, is that machine politics at least served the immigrant communities that were being neglected by the city. Well, Mayor Walsh says something. He doesn't talk about machine politics, but there's a moment in the film where he talks to a group of Latina uh, city hall employees. And he says, you know, you guys have a chance. If you want to get power and help your people continue, you know, continue to participate in politics. That's what every ethnic group has done in Boston. That's what we Irish have done. You can do the same thing. And the more power you gain in city government, the more you'll be able to help uh, uh, your, your people. And, and you know, it, it's, it's obvious, but, uh, but it needs to be done. Well, it's obvious, except that, you know, for so long there was, it didn't it happen. Possible, right. It was almost impossible for that door to even be open to so many people, so many different communities. I want to ask you something about your use of sound. Um, Manola Dargis in the Times Review mentions the opening of the film. Uh, she says, City Hall is an exploration of civil society and the common good. It's instructed that it opens on a sunny cityscape of autumnal trees, glass and steel towers, and clouds drifting across a blue sky. There are few people around, but more soon arrive, trickling and streaming into City Hall and its many tributaries. The thing, I'm not, I'm not um, saying the Almanola, but I want to say that the one thing that struck me the second time I watched the film is that you also hear sirens. It's the first thing you hear in the film are sirens. And I find, and I may be wrong, but I could have sworn I've heard sirens at the opening of another one of your films. I can't recall which. And I'm wondering if this is just your way of conveying the white noise of a city. Here we are in an urban setting where we're all so used to hearing sirens. Uh, even Film Forum is just around the corner from fire department. So of course they have sirens all the time. 
or is it some indication of some sense of uh, a crisis going on somewhere? Well, I mean, everything in the final film is deliberate. Uh, and uh, uh, the sirens are a, a very typical city sound. Uh, whether the crisis is somebody being taken to a hospital because they've had a heart attack or uh, a woman is in labor and is being rushed uh, to the delivery room or uh, somebody's been shot. Uh, so, uh, uh, but it's a common city sound. It, it wasn't done to suggest any one of those things, but it was done to suggest all of them or you know, it was, yeah, I mean, I, I think your characterization is ac accurate, not, but it wasn't meant to suggest that the city was in crisis, but, uh, but rather that there was a, uh, that this is a characteristic city sound. Because it is a sound that we, you know, we tune out now, right? So in a way we tune out the stories of other people in the city as we, I grew up you know, with the sounds of sirens, of course, and living in this, growing up in a city. And it's interesting that you call attention to something that I think we take for granted. Uh, it may be indexical, it may be some sense of here is a city, right? Here are the sounds of the city, here is the sirens of the city, or the, here are the church bells over the images of a, of a uh, cemetery. Um, but it also calls attention to the idea that there are stories that we, we, look past and the ways in which you show people who we often look beyond or through um, so often in this film. Um, well, people we don't know anything about. No one know anything about or don't care to know anything about, right? Right. right. Um, but can you say something about your use of sound? Obviously, you know, you were able to make films because of sync sound uh, and mobile camera equipment starting in the 60s. But say something about how you use sound and how it... Well, I mean, you, you know, the, from, if you don't have a good picture and good sound, you, it, you're, you're pretty limited. I mean, you can, you can somewhat improve a movie in the editing, but you can't really make you know, a movie that satisfies you if you don't start off with good picture and good sound. Uh, and, but I am very careful uh, about recording the sound. Uh, uh, you know, for example, in the garbage truck uh, sequence, uh, I, I really literally put the microphone right next to the, the teeth of the garbage truck hmm. to, to get, you know, that, uh, and, and when they, they, they threw in an oven or an outdoor grill and you hear it being crunched, I mean, you really got the sound of the crunch. Well, I mean, the, the sound would have been different had I recorded that sound uh, from 50 feet away. Uh, but, you know, I, I'm always conscious uh, during the shooting of, of, of the sound and try to get as good sound as I can, as it's just as important to get really good picture. Why is it so satisfying to watch garbage trucks crush box mattresses and other detritus. I mean, it's unbelievably satisfying. You want that scene to go on forever. Well, good. No, but, but, <laughs> but it was also, it was both fun to shoot and a lot of fun to edit because in the editing, I tried to establish a rhythm to the work that it doesn't have in, uh, if you're just standing on the street, watching the garbage truck go by. Mm -hmm. So it's an illustration of how in the editing and to some extent in the shooting, you can transform, you have to transform the material so that it becomes a movie. I mean, the, what I'm trying to do is make dramatic narrative movies. I mean, for example, like, I mean, if I wanted to show there was a garbage truck in Boston, uh, if people collecting garbage, I just could have a wide shot of the garbage truck going from one, end, one the beginning of the frame through the end of the frame. And you would know, you know, I, I would have documented that the garbage is collected in Boston. But in editing it that way, I, I tried to suggest both the nature of the work and the rhythm of the work and the, the internal feeling 
that's connected with the disposition of garbage. And the street payments. I'll say whether it, it's not for me to say whether it works, but you see it in the film in a much different way than you would see it as a spectator on the street. Well, and the street paving sequence is also mesmerizing for that same reason, the rhythms of, and, and there's nothing more satisfying than watching that clean line created on the pavement. Uh, you know, there's something deeply satisfying about just taking a moment and just focusing on something that, as I said before, you know, we take for granted, we walk right past and you- well, I mean, I'm all, I'm, you know, what I have in my mind is, is a very basic thing. I'm totally aware that I'm always trying to make a movie. Mm -hmm. I want to turn it over to our audience to see if they have questions. Let me ask you a completely unrelated question just because I've always been curious about it. You have a, a loyal, avid following in Japan and I'm wondering, I've always wondered, why do you think that is? Do you have any idea? Uh, I have no idea. I'm always pleased that a distributor is interested in showing my films. I mean, I, uh, just recently, a uh, distributor went, bought Boxing Gym. Well, I made Boxing Gym, I don't know. 20 years ago. Years no, ago. No, that's, no, 10 years ago, 10 years ago. Uh, uh, and, but uh, Ex Libris and Jackson Heights and, uh, uh, and some other films had been successful, so they picked up Boxing Gym. But my films are very popular in China, and I've never sold a film in China. <laughs> you never had um, a Q&A in China, I guess. No, I mean, you know, uh, you know I, I suppose I'm supposed to be flattered that, the, 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 that they're stolen and pirated. But, you know, I, you know, unlike other people, I like to eat. So I, I'm disappointed that they don't, uh, in fact... I wouldn't be surprised if they've been pirated in Jackson Heights as well. Well, I, oh, everybody's films are pirated, but it's right. on a much vaster scale in China. I mean, the, the pirating problem is very hard to do anything about. But, I mean, I think sometimes the film, people that pirate films don't realize that filmmakers are dependent on the income of the film, both to live and to make other films. Uh, I'm not sure that's a great concern for people in China who otherwise would never be able to see your films. No, well, anyway, nothing to be done. Nothing to be done. Let me see if there's some questions here. Um, I'll try to summarize them. Meetings turn up frequently in your documentaries. How central do you think they are to the pictures you wish to give of an institution? Could you see doing a documentary without a meeting? Well, the, the, the meetings in the film are a reflection of the activities that take place at, uh, at the institution, which is the subject of the film. Uh, uh, Boxing gym doesn't have many meetings or a couple of scenes in the office of the guy that runs the gym, but they, they, I don't think one could qualify them as meetings in the sense of what happens at, in, uh, at Berkeley or Ex Libris uh, or City Hall. I mean, it, it, it's, it's not that I set out to include a lot of meetings in the film. I set out to show sequences that illustrate the activities of the place. And if there are a lot of meetings, I have to show a lot of meetings because otherwise it wouldn't be a fair representation or what I think is a fair representation of the subject. How do you capture, well, let me just follow that question. How do you capture reaction shots? If you're, if you're filming somebody- Reaction shots are completely fictional because yeah. you know, when, when there's a lull in the meeting, in other words, when we're not filming uh, somebody who's talking, I decide, well, it's a boring moment. So, I mean, as, as occurs in any meeting. Uh, uh, so at that time, you take shots of people who are attending the meeting who aren't talking. Because I know, I've learned from experience, and the experience being when, when I first started making movies, when I didn't have enough of those shots uh, that I discovered that I needed in the editing, I learned as a consequence of not having them to collect them the next time I was out. Uh, so that I always, anytime there's a meeting and there's a, what I consider to be a lull in the meeting, you take shots of people turning their head, uh, writing uh, with a pencil and paper, uh, turning left to right or right to left or uh, their eyes moving or whatever. And 
those are ex extremely important because without those, I could never reduce the length of the meeting, say for most of the meetings in City Hall in their original length were an hour and a half. What you see in the movie is maybe eight or 10, at most eight or 10 minutes of that. And the eight, that eight or 10 minutes is assembled from all over the lot, 20 seconds here, 30 seconds there, a minute and a half there, from the original sequence, there, where it's a reduction from the original sequence, but made to appear as if it took place the way you're seeing it by the use of cutaways or reaction shots, which of course are not the actual reactions of the participants to what you're hearing. So in that sense, it's just another aspect of the, uh, another illustration of the fictional aspect of this kind of filmmaking. And of course, it's also a form of commentary on what's being said. Yes. For your yeah. editing. Yeah, right, right, exactly. Uh, what was the most difficult part of City Hall to film? Mm, I'm pausing because I, I don't know. I mean, um, I, I don't, I don't know that anything was particularly difficult. Each, uh, each situation presents its own challenges. I mean, one scene that was particularly somewhat difficult to film was the scene when the building inspector is um, uh, visiting a contractor who's con uh, renovating a, an a, a two or three story, a three story building in East Boston and making it into a condo. Uh, and uh, there was a big window because it was a nice picture window so that the purchaser of the apartment could see part of Boston Harbor. Uh, but there's a lot of light coming in. So we <laughs> had to move around so that, because th they were standing in front of the window. Uh, 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 so, I mean, it's that sort of technical problem. You have to quickly figure out a solution so that you can shoot the participants and not have it all glare. You faced a similar problem, didn't you, with National Gallery in, in, in filming paintings? Is that not the case? Oh, no, that, that, that was different. That was different. Uh, occasionally, because there was a light on the painting, but not really. I mean, what I decided before I, I began filming National Gallery, that I decided that whenever it was possible, I wanted to show the painting inside the frame. And it wasn't always possible, given the type of lens you use, but it was very often possible because I thought if you were inside the frame, even though it might have cut off a little bit of the painting, you were more likely to respond to the subject matter of the painting and it would be less an object on the wall. And, and, and since the paintings that I selected to show in the film are thematically very important in the film, I wanted, and I, I also wanted to give as good an impression as I could of the artist's work. And, and the frame, at least in my view, created an automatic distance between the viewer of the film and the painting. Mm -hmm. So whenever it was possible, you, uh, you, you're seeing the painting without the frame. I mean, this is also parenthetical, but is it difficult to, show, to convey scale of paintings when you're filming that way? Well, I mean, it's not because you're filming that way. It'd be, equally difficult, I mean, because if you're showing the frame, it's only, uh, the frame, uh, what you're seeing is only slightly larger because the frame is, is narrow. I mean, the frame is usually much thick, thicker than that. Mm -hmm. so it doesn't, it, it doesn't, for me, that's not the difference it makes. The difference it makes is the painting is much more alive, more vivid mm -hmm. uh, than it would be. It's, it's less of an object and it's, uh, you feel more like you're inside the painting or you have the opportunity, whether you feel that way or not, you have the opportunity if you respond to the painting to feel uh, the story and particularly uh, uh, when, you're not dealing, when you're dealing with the figurative painting, uh, you, you, you're more like, at least I think you're more likely to get a sense of the story of the painting. Um, uh, than you are if the painting is at a distance. And you mentioned you do the same with, you convey the same with paintings at Fanwell Hall in City Hall. 
Yeah, I did the same thing there for the same reason. Uh, I know we have to wrap up, but I want to ask you one last question, which is that given all, as I'm returning to one of my first questions, which is that given all that's happened in the past year, you've on occasion returned to the same subject. I'm thinking, for example, of high school. Could you see returning to City Hall in the aftermath of everything we've been through in this past year? No, I don't think so, because there are too many subjects uh, that I haven't done that I'd like to do. And... You know, even though I made two films on high school, the only similarity between the two films is that they both take place in buildings and that there are teachers and students. Uh, uh, because uh, high school, the original high school was made in Northeast High in Philadelphia. There were 4,000 students and the student teacher ratio was 30 to one. Uh, 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 the second high school film was made in Central Park East which was an experimental high school in Spanish Harlem. And the student teacher ratio was about uh, one teacher to three students. Uh, and, and the a curriculum was designed to, uh, to pick up this, to have the students interested in their own, in the cultures from which they came from and not abstract uh, cultures which they they had no personal experience, so that they, they were more engaged, or the effort was made to engage them more quickly in the material because it was material it was chosen based on their own experience. You, you mentioned wanting to uh, potentially film in South Bend, was, but how did you know about Buttigieg? He wasn't a presidential candidate. No, no, I, I, I had read an uh, article in the New York Times about, uh, about but Buttigieg, Buttigieg yeah. that, he, that he was a good young mayor. I mean, it was like, like the whole experience of making these movies, so much is related to chance. I mean, it was complete chance that my letter to the Mayor Walsh happened to be opened by somebody who liked my movies. Otherwise, who knows what would have happened? Well, we're, we are yeah. fortunate as a result. I mean, I mean I, I've said it a lot, but I mean, I believe it. The model in these movies, in all aspects of making these movies, is Las Vegas. You roll the dice and you, you know, you take you've never filmed, have you? I'm trying to remember. You've never filmed in Vegas. No, I went there once. I tried to get permission there, but, but I, uh, I almost had permission. But, and I don't know if I would have done it because it, I, I, I might be, you might be able to do it now, but at that time, it's always night in the casinos. Mm. Uh, and at that time, it was, too, it was really very dark. And I also, I found Las Vegas terribly dispiriting, really, really depressing place. I, I, I left as quickly as I could. I had always wanted to go there, but I, once there, I didn't like it. Yeah, I'm with you on that. Well, Fred, listen, I want to thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us today. And I know uh, it's tough in Paris, especially now this week, it's become even tougher. So I wish you well and, and uh, all of us well, and yeah. especially this coming week. Well, thank you, so thank you, Josh, and thank you for doing the interview. I appreciate that. Thank you too, Joe, and thank the people at Film Forum. I'm del my long association with Film Forum, something that pleases me very much. Well, um, thank you, Fred. It's always an extreme privilege to hear you speak. And today was no exception. This was a really wonderful conversation. And I'm going to take a moment to quickly flatter you and tell you that you're personally one of my favorite filmmakers of all time. So oh, thank, thank you, you so much for a lifetime yeah. of exceptional yeah. work. Um, one quick thing before I leave, I'd like to ask all of our guests and our moderators, we can start with Josh and then Fred. Um, what are you working on now? What's next? What's coming down the line? Josh? Well, uh, among other things, I've been stockpiling shows for when we can return to our cinema, but also we've begun thinking about how to uh, create interesting programs for virtual cinema, for streaming that we will launch in the coming weeks. And uh, try to come up with things that aren't being done by Film Forum or other theaters around the world. Uh, you know, we're all in a new paradigm now and we're all finding our sea legs. So stay, stay tuned, watch here. We'll, we'll have some news in the coming weeks for, for MoMA. Well, I um, severely miss going to MoMA, so I can't no. wait to return. Um, and Fred, anything 
for you? Well, I, what I'm working on is surviving. Yeah. Uh, I mean, because I can't make, I mean, even, even if I could work, even if it wasn't a quarantine, even if I wanted to work in Paris, I wouldn't uh, because it's too dangerous. I mean, because in my films, as you well know, they're all, I meet hundreds of people in the course of the day, so it would be too risky. So what I'm working on is a script for a, a fiction film uh, hmm. that I can shoot. It's a monologue. Uh, I like doing that. I've done another monologue fiction film and uh, that I can do with one actress and a very small crew. I look forward to that. Um, me, me thank too. you both gentlemen for being with us today. It was really, really such a pleasure. We thank you. And thank thank you. And stay safe, Fred. Thank, thank you, Josh. Uh, I'd like to take this uh, time to thank Zipporah Films, especially Karen Konacek. I'd like to thank Michael Tuckman and everyone on the Film Forum staff who helped put this event together, especially our premieres programmer, Mike Majori, happy birthday, and our director, Karen Cooper. If you have yet to see City Hall, please consider renting it on our virtual cinema platform at filmforum.org. We are proud to present a dynamic selection of premieres, including documentaries like City Hall, World Cinema, and American Independence, as well as our restored classics. Finally, please stay connected to us through our email newsletter, also our social media handle, Film Forum NYC, on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. We will keep you up to date with additions to our virtual cinema roster and any upcoming virtual events. Again, thank you for being with us today, and we wish you health and happiness. Take care.